A few months ago, I was listening to a podcast episode from today's guest, and I knew immediately that I wanted to have her on to discuss the topic of making adult friends. Amanda Sovic Johnston is a clinical psychologist who specializes in working with preteen and teenage girls, as well as families of all ages. She has the Active and Connected podcast, and she and her husband have three active boys. I can't wait for us to dive into this topic all about making and keeping adult friends. Before we dive in, I do just want to note that everything that Amanda shares today is intended to be educational and should not be considered medical advice. Hi, I'm Allison Edgity, a pediatric sleep and wellness coach and a mom of two. I love to help parents find solutions. This is How Long Till Bedtime. Well, hey, Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today. I think most adults would agree that it can be tricky to make new friends once you become an adult, particularly, I think, once you have kids. And it's not always easy to meet new people, or I should say maybe it is easy to meet new people because we're running around with our kids, but it's not always easy to turn those new people into close friends. I think that's the big gap is the close friend part. So when I heard your podcast episode where you talked about making adults friends, I immediately asked you to come on and discuss this topic with me. So before we dive in, I always like to start by asking my guests what inspired them to get into their line of work. Oh, that's a great question, Allison. I really appreciate that question. So I'm a child psychologist first, and now I am an entrepreneur and a CEO of Virginia Family Therapy. And we have a pretty big group practice now. And I think what inspired me to get into my work first is I think even a moment of helping someone feel better or feel joy is important right? So if I can help someone, even as a young kid, just helping someone feel one second of joy, you're adding to someone's life. And I feel like that is so important. And so now I help people feel healthier and happier and help families become more connected, but it really is rooted in helping people just have one second that is better than it could have been because I'm helping them. I love that. I mean, it's really cheesy, but I'm pretty cheesy. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay, so let's dive right into this topic. Why do you think it's more challenging to make friends as an adult than, say, when we were in high school or college? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons that make it more challenging. I think, number one, it is always challenging to make new friends when you're going through a transition, especially when you're having a new baby, your world is rocked. Your lifestyle is rocked. Everything is different. And so the glue, the old glue that kind of kept you together, isn't there anymore. Kept your friendships together, isn't there anymore. And so you have to find new, new forms of glue to hold your friendships together. So in high school, you're seeing people all the time. You're in classes, you're driving to and from soccer games, you're you're seeing people with regularity. And then when we come adults, we don't see people with quite as much regularity as we used to. Yeah, I mean, even if you have friends at work, I feel like once you become a parent, You can't just say like, all right, let's go to happy hour after work. I mean, even that, you just lose so much of that on the whim freedom once you become a parent. Oh, absolutely. And so much of what you think about is parenting. So even if you really want to, if you go out to happy hour and you do have some of that freedom, you know, because you've arranged for childcare there's still a part of your brain that is thinking about your baby or thinking about your family. So it's not as easy to be 100% in. It takes work when you're out with friends to really be present and really embrace those moments and kind of let, you know, the feeding schedule 
go behind you. Cause that's what I always did. Would I would be going out with people so excited to be there. And I would be like, Oh, you know, it's been two and a half hours until I fed my baby. I have 15 more minutes. What do I need to say in 15 more minutes? It's just, you carry your family with you and that's beautiful. And that's hard. It's funny you say that. Cause last weekend I was at a small birthday dinner and of course the topic of kids come up. And so one of the moms texted her husband or no, actually texted her daughter and said, did you read this book in middle school? And then the husband texted her and said, stop texting your daughter about this book. And why don't you guys start talking about the hot men on whatever show? Or something? <laughs> <laughs> and we were all cracking up that her husband called us out. Cause it's like, oh gosh, it's so easy to go down that you know, rabbit hole of like just talking about the kids. Oh, and I personally, and I think part of this is because I'm a psychologist. So when I'm with my girlfriends, I can talk about like details of kids' lives. Like I can talk about what they ate and what they're doing. I can get into it, but I am personally more filled by women and men talking about their experience of parenting, right? The, the, the feelings that we have around parenting instead of the details of parenting, because I think that can lead to a deeper conversation that's more fulfilling for me and the other people. I love that. That's a great distinction. Well, it's hard to do. It's really easy to get into those details. We all do it. And and so when I find myself doing it, I like to pull back. That's awesome. So when I think back of adulthood and friendship, I had a great friend group when I lived in Chicago for the seven years after college. And at first we were all single and then we all got married and that was great. Went to everyone's wedding, which was so fun. And my husband also had a great friend group from his grad school, which was in Chicago. And then we moved to Charlottesville, which was totally my idea. And I was thrilled. It was a good, to one. Do it was it. A good one. Yeah, it was a good one. And I don't regret it, but I got pregnant not too long after we moved here, and it was much harder to make friends than I expected, and our life really changed, and so then we were in this town where we didn't have a core friend group, and I had a baby, and none of us, neither of us have family here, and do you find that it's even harder to make friends once you've kind of moved somewhere post-kids or kind of right around having kids, or it sounds like you're even saying even if you have your friend group and have kids, that friend group might be challenged. So what we know about friends, actually, this isn't what we know about making friends, but what we know about life is that when relationships are built on connections and seeing people, right? So you can't have a relationship with folks if you're not spending time with them. So any time that you as a person significantly change the way you're spending time. And there's a transition either when you move or when you have a baby that's going to take a lot of your time or you start a new job or you, I don't know, maybe you pick up a really important hobby like you're training for a marathon. Anything that significantly changes the way you're spending your time, your friendships are going to change because you you don't have that built-in routine of seeing them. Now you can make it a priority to create that time, but it's going to be difficult when you change the way you're spending your time. Yeah. And so I'm curious, do you think it's important to say like, this is a season of my life and this friendship may fade for a while, or do you think it's more important to focus on working at cultivating and keeping those friendships? Or do you view it that kind of friendships have their season and we need to be open to letting some go and bringing new ones in. I think it's both. And, and that makes me sound like a therapist, but I think it is truly, truly both. And I think that if we're talking about folks who are having their first baby, I think it is such a large transition and lifestyles become so different. And, and you as a mom are experiencing something so just all encompassing because it should be, and it is all encompassing. I think it's okay to go through a period where you're kind of like, I have too much on my plate right now to really invest in, you know, prioritizing these old friendships and investing in making new friendships. I think it's just a really difficult time. 
And I think that there are some people that are going to be with you for life. And you want to make sure that you are creating time and space for those folks because those are the people that are going to feed you. So I think when you go through a big transition, it's really figuring out who does help you and feed you and you want to have a connection with no matter what is going on and who can you kind of return back to if if the timing is right. Yeah. And I have um, a best friend that I've had since I was two years old and she's actually going to be coming on the podcast, right? Following yours. And interestingly enough, another lifelong friend I've had, I was exchanging messages with yesterday and she had said, well, you and Laura have the kind of friendship that storybooks should write about. Mm -hmm. And it's great. And I'm forever grateful for her and I'm bringing her on and we're going to talk about what makes our friendship work. But And we're very different people, which makes it so interesting. And it's fantastic. But we don't live anywhere near each other. And she, I think, is better at making (laughs) in-person friends in her current life than I would say I am. She prioritizes it. She's made great friends in her in-person life. I'm curious your thoughts on in-person friends versus your lifelong friends that no longer live anywhere near you. So this is another time I'm going to get out of answering the question, which is saying, I think both and, right? I think I have a friendship similar to your lifelong friend, and I I really see her as family. She's my sister. And so I really prioritize. We need people who have seen us through our whole lives. So if I'm upset about something that happened with my mom, well, my best friend Casey is the person who knows my mom and is going to care about what's happening with my mom. So it's really important to maintain some of those friendships with long-term people because they know you for a lifetime. They know you at your core. And... For new moms in particular, society has not set up these villages and this community that we need to to be healthy at this really difficult time. So it becomes up to us to be proactive about creating the community so that we can just make it as new moms. It is so hard and we need people around us. So again, Allison, sorry, it's both and. (laughs) No, I love that. And one of the things, this is kind of a little bit going off the track, but I struggled with letting some of my new friends in when I had my baby. So they, a lot of them already had kids. So they were like, even though they didn't really know me well, like, can we bring you a meal? Can we do whatever? And I did let them do some things, but I'm so Mm self-sufficient and they weren't people I had known for very long. And So I remember thinking like, I should not be letting these people do all this stuff. And now I preach all the time, like new moms, let all the people, good friends, close friends, acquaintances, whoever's offering, like let them pour into you, let them be your friend, even if they're not going to be your closest friend. I mean, I'm cooking meals for moms all over the neighborhood. And so I really think that's also important is to let friends in when you're in this transition, even if you don't have a lot to give at that time. Oh, a million. And actually, the research kind of shows when you're making friends, a really key component about how to make friends is being vulnerable. And accepting help from other people is a is a way of demonstrating your vulnerability. So if you are the kind of person that says, I don't need help, I've got it, essentially you're saying, I I can't get that close to you. We can only be close to folks when we're feeling some level of vulnerability that goes both ways. And accepting help is a key way of demonstrating vulnerability. Yeah, I love that. And on the topic of vulnerability, that kind of leads into something else I want to talk about. Because in that podcast episode I listened to where you talked about making adult friends, you mentioned research that talked about the three conditions that are needed for a make, making new friends. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you what all three of them are, and then I'll go back and talk about each one. So the first one is seeing people in a routine. So seeing people regularly. The second one is running into them randomly. And then the third one is being in a space where you offer vulnerability. So again, it's seeing them routinely, running into them randomly, and then being vulnerable. And so let's talk about the first one because 
I mean, you're a sleep expert, so you probably love to talk about routine, right? (laughs) (laughs) I love some routine. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about routines, when we're talking about making friends, essentially what that, what we know as parents is that what is in a routine gets done. So when we're talking about making friends, if I have a routine where I know that every Tuesday afternoon, I'm going to go on a walk with someone, I'm not kind of like spending all of that mental energy and texting like, Hey, can we go on that walk this Tuesday? Hey, Tuesday doesn't work for me. Can we do Wednesday? Hey, what about this? When something is routine, it gets done. And so really talking about being somewhere at the same place all regularly. Now, when you're talking about making friends, that can look a little bit different. And this is why it is easy to make friends in high school and college is being in the same place regularly and kind of chatting with folks. So if you are a new mom, it's going to the same mommy and me class or the same parenting class. This is why many folks who go to those kind of prenatal classes develop really good friendships with those folks because they're seeing people regularly. It could be going to the same gym class. I made a ton of friends going to the same workout class regularly. It could be another strategy was after preschool pickup every day of the week, there was a crew of friends and I, we would go to the same park and eat lunch just from 12 to 1230. Now we couldn't do it every day, but I always knew there was an option. There was going to be a crew there. There's no planning. It's just kind of like, I'm here and, and you're going to see me with regularity when you're there. Yeah. I love that. Remind me of the second one then. So that was routine. Yep. And then the second one is also seeing them randomly. So say you are, you know, I I did make a lot of friends at a workout class. So you would see someone, maybe I would stand next to them at the workout class, not know them. I might be like, oh, that was a hard class. And then it would be over. Right. But I'd see them every day for a week. And then maybe I'll see them going on a walk near my neighborhood. And when you see them going on a walk, you're like, oh, I know this person. How do I extend this relationship a little bit more? Like, oh, hey, where do you live? You see them randomly and you kind of take it to the next level when you see them. Another reason that's really important is because it lets you know who has the same interests as you. When I had when I had a three-month-old, when Cole was three months we lived in Fry Spring and I went on a walk one day and I saw this very cute couple. I mean, the woman was pregnant, the dad was handsome. And I was like, oh, they look so nice. I'd love to be friends with them. And then that night I went to Fridays after five and I saw them and we were like, oh, hey, like awkward stare. Like we just saw each other. And then the next morning I saw them out at brunch on the downtown mall. And by that time I was like, clearly we have a lot in common. We like to walk. We live in the same neighborhood. We like to go to music shows. We like to go out and eat. So when you see people randomly, you know what you have in common. And so really talking to the people that you run into, because you know you're going to know what to talk about. And so not only are you seeing them routinely, but you're capitalizing on the moments when you see them randomly. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I met a gal um, right at in the fall, like right as tennis was winding down. So, oh, so I got into tennis, which has a whole nother side. Story. Oh, I, I want to get into tennis. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. So I'm about, you know, 18 months in. And so um, met someone who's new to the neighborhood. I think it was like my last day of tennis in the fall session. So on that last day, met her. Turns out her husband's from my same town in Indiana, which is small world. But then we kind of go on our merry way. And then I saw her at Tavla um, mm-hmm. and I saw her somewhere else and I thought we love food. So my husband and I, you know, live in Chicago, love food. And I thought they love food. And initially I thought we should have them over for dinner, but I don't get my act together. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just emailed her yesterday because she's going to be joining my tennis team this spring. And I said, Hey, we got a reservation at the new steakhouse. Uh, I've seen you at some restaurants that we like. Would you guys want to come with us? I cracked up at her response because ours is like next Friday. And she's like, we're going there next Thursday. No. And it's funny. And she's like, can you join us? Which we can't. But I thought, oh, 
it worked. Like we do, we were seeing each other. We do have these things in common. And I was like, great minds think alike. We both wanted to go see that, re- go to that restaurant. So while it didn't work out, it is kind of what you're saying was I noticed something and I was like, all right, I'm just going to ask her if she wants to go. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? They say no. Well, I love that. And this really brings me to this part around new moms. I feel like I I don't know if you had this experience, but sometimes when I had just a baby, I would go to a park and I would see this group of moms who looked like they knew each other. Or I would go to the pool and be like, oh, there's that group of people that all know each other and I'm a little bit left out. And I would feel anxious about approaching folks, right? But the reality is, is that we're all in a transition together. And so all it really takes is one person to take a step forward, right? It takes one person to take a lead and say like, hey, do you want to kind of take this to the next level? Do you, what's your phone number? Do you want to go out to eat? Here's something I'm struggling with. And so I think what I have really learned is that if someone has to take that next step, might as well be me, right? Why not? Why wait for someone else to do it? Might as well be me. And if they can't do it, it's probably because they're busy with their own mom stuff. It, it's, I mean, sometimes I'm a little, you know, too chatty, which believe me, I'm a little too chatty sometimes, but, but, and I'll take that feedback and I'll think about it and I'll reflect, but I won't take a rejection from someone else too personally because I know their lives are crazy busy. So it's probably more about them than it is me. Yeah. And I do think a lot of times chances are you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you take that step um, to be the one to take the step. But I also know um, both from experience and just what I see even in my own neighborhood that there are some clicky groups. And so I'm curious your thoughts of how you help people bounce back when someone, you take that leap. You're like, all right, I'm going to talk to those ladies at the pool. And I'm I, you know, I really like so-and-so, or you, there's someone you're really drawn to that you're like, I would really like to be their friend. Mm-hmm. And I can think of one person, this was years ago, but we are friendly now. Uh-huh. I went to this drinks with her and I came home and I'm like, oh my gosh, she gives me so much life. She's like the funniest person I've ever been in a room with. And after a couple of times of hanging out there, I realized, oh, I'm not her cup of tea. Like I'm very intuitive and we are still very friendly. I see her all the time, but I was like, well, that sucks. <laughs> but like, I'm not her cup of tea. I adore her, but it is clear it was not, you know, mutual. And so I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. I think that's a really good question. Number one, I think it's amazing that you, you know, continue to try with her for a while, right? Like you, at least, it sounds like you went to drinks a few times. I think that's great. I think that, you know, I think that happens in life. And I think that we as adults, you know, we have a lot of coping skills. We've probably been rejected a fair number of times in our lives. And so, so I would almost reflect that back to you, Allison. Like, how did you get through that? Cause I don't think you're like, you're probably a little torn up about it, but not tons torn up. How'd you get through it? No, I'm not an overly sensitive person and I'm a very resilient person. So stuff like that does not really get me down. Um, and I kind of move past it. This, I can just accept what it is and move on. But I definitely have friends who have been a little distraught over how someone has treated them that they wanted to be friends with. And it's, it's a little hard for me to, to coach them through that because for me, I'm like, well, I just can't be everyone's cup of tea. Like you said, you're too chatty girlfriend, sign me up right with you. I mean, (laughs) I overshare. Yep. I'm way too chatty and I have just come to accept like, well, that is who I am and I will not be everyone's cup of tea and that's okay with me. But I do think I've done a lot of kind of inner work, I think, to be that person. And I do think sports really helped me with that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious for the people who, I also appreciate that a lot more people feel more sensitive about things. Um, So I don't know if you have thoughts on that. But I think you've done the work, right? I think you essentially have put out there some strategies. So I think some strategies when you're feeling that way is understanding you might not be everyone's cup of tea and that's okay because you're probably someone's cup of tea, right? Like you're someone's cup of tea and it's about figuring out who are those people. So if you weren't that person's cup of tea, 
you can, your choice is to kind of really feel really, really bad about it and stick with it and not try with other people. And we know where that's going to land you. That's going to land you probably feeling lonely and not having the community that you want. Or you can say, I'm not that person's cup of tea. That sucks. But but where can I get the connection that I want, right? Like, and, and to be honest with you, it sounds really great that these women were feeling a little rejected and reached out to you for the connection that they truly want. So that's the piece is being vulnerable with someone else in order to create the type of connection that you're actually yearning for in the, in the end. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean, reach out when you're lonely. It's great. Yeah, so I think that takes us nicely into the third point right? Because the third point was vulnerability. Yes. And this one is really, really important. And this, again, is part of why being in college is a really, really good space to make friends and also being in those kind of prenatal classes. Because the whole point of that time of life is that you're going through a transition and it is a scary transition. Something big is going to happen and you are automatically going to be more anxious. And so when you share that anxiety with folks, you are demonstrating they can help you. You are letting people know you better. And therefore that's just increasing the connection and the emotional relationship. So by being vulnerable and letting someone know something a little bit deeper about you is a way of kind of leveling up your intimacy. Yes, we're talking about intimacy with friends, but you're leveling it up. It's, I mean, when we talk about talking about babies and routines, it can be really, really easy to talk about like, well, my baby slept from two to four yesterday morning and then my baby woke up. And believe me, y'all, by the way, Allison, one of my friends, when I had my third baby, one of my friends saw you and every day after she saw you, she would share a group text with her and two other moms. We all had babies at the same time. And we would be like, what did Allison say? And we just texted together to get us through sleep training our third kid. So it was, you were a lifesaver to me. You didn't even know it. But what was more important at that time was really saying, I am so tired and I'm so scared and I'm so vulnerable and my, you know, I'm fighting with my husband and I'm like anxious about this. So really taking it to the emotions that are going to help you feel more connected. But there's something else I want to say about this, right? Is that's easy to do when you're already close. So one of the things that I help folks do is figure out how to be a little bit vulnerable with folks they don't know that well. So it sounds like you and I are relatively similar, like we'll overshare. I'm always like, how am I a therapist with no boundaries? Um, but I do share a lot about myself and and I, sh- I do it in therapy and I do it out in the world. And that's because if I'm vulnerable, I know that it's going to make other folks vulnerable. I'm saying it's okay to show yourself because I'm doing it. So show me yourself too. And so I help folks kind of think of safe ways to show some vulnerability and do and do it you know when you're kind of milling around watching your toddler at the playground and you're just like following them up these you know a slide and you're like I'm doing this again and this is so boring really saying to a mom next to you like oh my kid is having a really hard time with these meltdowns after school like is your kid doing that or anything where you're asking, you're saying something that's hard for you and you're asking for support and help and kind of camaraderie. But you have to show that safe vulnerability to get that person engaged and feel safe sharing their own vulnerability. That makes a lot of sense. I had um, my kind of office husband um, when I first was an investment banker, he always talked about, I think he called it the bank account of trust. Oh, yep. And he had this, I think he learned it in business school, actually, but where you make a deposit and then they make a deposit and you want to keep depositing into the bank account of trust. And that always stuck with me is like, are people depositing or taking out of that bank account of trust? So I view what you just said is like, you're making the first deposit into that account. Yep, absolutely. And it's a, you know, I actually will tell almost anybody anything. So so for me, I can go pretty deep in a vulnerability with a stranger. That's just how I'm wired. 
I think there are other people who have a hard time being vulnerable and that's okay. And it's hard for them to be trusting in the first place. That's also okay. So it's really thinking about how to do it safely, right? Like what's something that you can reveal that's not going to make you so anxious that like you can't sleep at night? Like, why did I say that to that woman? So it's really like, oh, I don't know. Does, do these shoes match these pants? Or like... I get really frustrated when my kid does this or man, I got in a fight with my husband. Like what are those small little deposits that don't feel too vulnerable, but will deepen the relationship just a little bit? Yeah, I think that's a good point as well, Um, because I like you, I tend to be an overshare, although I do think it makes me good at what I do. I think it helps because... Mm -hmm. I'm happy to like throw myself under the bus of something I did parenting wise. Yep. <laughs> so it's like, don't worry, I got a story for you. Um, but then also to like my mom, for example, is a very private person. And so she is definitely wouldn't, she'd probably die if she knew all the things I share about myself. And so she's a very private person. So I do think it is important to realize that everyone's vulnerability is not going to look the same. Absolutely. And so really it's checking in with yourself. And by the way, I have had those nights where I have gone to sleep and been like, why did I share that? That was too much. And it's important for me to reflect on that because that's my way of saying, okay, too much vulnerability, Amanda, you got to rein it in. Like you didn't have the trust to go that deep with that person. Right. So it's checking in with yourself too. And that makes me want to talk about another topic is drinking as it relates to friends, because I think a lot of times drinking people can overshare and Mm -hmm. then people have that like next day regret of like, oh gosh, why did I say all that? Mm -hmm. And I also think, you know, people have different views on drink. Like my best friend, Laura stopped drinking. I don't know if it was like two years ago. So like she no longer drinks. And so I think that changed some of her friend group and um, you know, they got really into fitness and whatever. So I do think, and people get over older, like typically speaking, like party days are done. Mm -hmm. And so that's a whole nother transition point. And so I'm curious if you have thoughts on how drinking plays into adult friendship. That is such a good question. And, you know, I read this study and that was saying that essentially from an evolutionary perspective, drinking has to be providing something to, to, to the, to mankind kind of living on. And, and what the theory was is that when we drink, our inhibitions go down, we can make up with people, we can be vulnerable, we can release endorphins and have fun. They used to have all these, the idea was there used to be these big parties after a war. And sometimes it would be two groups that didn't know each other, but celebrating and reconnecting together with alcohol. And so you can see in college, we're making all these stupid mistakes. And then we're like getting drunk with girls in the bathroom being like, I'm so sorry I said that to you. And I mean, I always walk in on girls in the bathroom still doing that. I love it. Um, So it does increase vulnerability and it can create social connections. Now, when we get older and our transitions, right, we're going through a different transition. I think it's important to be thoughtful about is this when you want to drink? Is this when you not want to drink? How do you sustain the relationship if you guys are on different paths? And I think all of it is okay. I just think you have to be aware of what you're doing and uh, and and be thoughtful of the relationships that you want to enter into. Does that make any sense? I'm not sure if I was totally clear yeah. on that. And I also think this comes back to me where I'm like, okay, well, that is what it is. I also think this is another moment where sometimes friendships seasons Mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. So if people want to stay on the party train and some people don't want to be on the party train or you want to be somewhere in the middle, then I think that's okay. And people can have a season where it's like, yeah, I know we all partied hardcore, but I'm not there now. Like I need to wake up and I need to function and I need to do all that. And so I also view that as sometimes friendships are going to shift over drinking And I'm okay with that. But I know that's a struggle for some because drinking is an interesting dynamic, I think, in life um, and friendships. And it can be tricky for some people when you kind of feel like you've aged or matured out of something or just you've changed how you want to feel. And not everyone's going to be on board. And I just think we have to accept 
what who people are and like decide what we want to go to. And I really, some of my relationships have, have really changed around this. Um, I think when I was making friends, when my kids were younger, I was drinking more. I was more vulnerable. It was what we did socially. It was so easy to kind of fall into that. I was also working out a lot. And then, so I would like go out and get drinks like later that night. Cause I was like, oh yeah, I've worked out a ton. But I do think now I have friends that are still drinking more. And I think, how do I get them in places where we're not drinking, right? So I might call them and go on a walk with them, or I might do a lunch because I still really value those friendships. And I really want to continue to be friends with people that I have been friends with for so long. I just am a little more proactive about when and how we are spending time together. And that's been really helpful. I love that. And I have several walking friends too. Not necessarily over the drinking thing, but it's just, I like, we can like walk and talk. Oh yeah. Um, and I love a good walk and talk. And so I think that's a great example. If things have shifted, maybe you don't want to go out and party with this person, but you can still get all the goodness that you want out of that relationship by just changing how you go about it. So I love that idea of the walk or the coffee or the lunch or. And here's what I'll say about that, Allison, is the way to make that stick is by making it a routine. Because before your routine was like going to the pool and having drinks or going out to dinner every Friday night and having families over and having drinks, that was the routine. It's what got done. If you change the routine to every Tuesday, 9 a.m., that's a walk. You're going to maintain that friendship, but it has to be a part of the routine in order to really make that shift happen in an effective, in an effective way. Yes. It's funny you say that because Beth, who works on this podcast, uh, she and I were at a breakfast with another friend who's like the busiest person we know. And every time we get together, it's like, why are we getting together more often? And Beth did say, Allison does block scheduling. And so we should make it every Monday, once a month, or she said, we should block it out. And it would work really well in Allison's schedule, the way she blocks her life. And it's funny, she said that, and I've heard you mention it. And I thought, I should do that with Mm -hmm. my friendships that I want to prioritize, because that's how my brain works. That's how I operate the best. And I have friends who definitely are best on a whim, like, let's go grab coffee right now. I'm like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Mm -hmm. My schedule is already blocked out and very scheduled. So I do love that idea Um, and it is something I want to try to do with my friends is make some of it more routine. Mm -hmm. You know, I have another, there's this new conversation happening right now. It's around something called the third space. And I'm going to get this a little messed up, but the third space is the space where people just kind of show up and it's not work and it's not home, but you just kind of show up and you develop social relationships. So you think about it as bars or parks or the pool, and there's really been a decline in third spaces since COVID. So COVID really kind of shut down a lot of these third spaces because we couldn't be in third spaces. So the fabric of society has shifted. Now, I still go to the pool, and the power in that for me is just being able to show up in a space and know that I'm going to see community without making a plan, right? Like I can just show up and my people will be there. And so I think if you're looking to make friends, it's really kind of identifying where are the third spaces around me and how can I get to them regularly and be a little vulnerable when I'm in that third space, because that's how you're going to elevate to the next level of friendship. Yeah. I love that. So I love all of this. I love everything you've said. I think it's going to give people a lot to think about. And we had asked the parents of my membership for any questions or thoughts that they had on this topic. And one mom had said that she moved 10 years ago to a Mm -hmm. smallish town and she has yet to make what she would call a really good friend. Mm -hmm. And she said, it feels like everyone already has their people and they aren't looking for new people. And she was curious if you had recommendations. I think we've kind of touched on that, but I can appreciate that if you are 10 years in, you are probably feeling pretty stinking stuck. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if you have just like a specific, not knowing her, but you know, one thing you would suggest she try? 
So I think number one, I appreciate how hard that is. Um, I felt stuck at some points in my life in Charlottesville and overall I'm pretty good at making friends and, and I've felt found it hard as well. So you're not alone. I think that knowing that everyone kind of goes through transitions and seasons. So essentially these people who already have their people might get bored of each other. They might get in a fight. One of them might stop drinking. And then that there will be changes and shifts that can allow you some entry points as long as you are ready to be a little bit vulnerable. So I might say, try a little bit, a very small amount of vulnerability and see if that can shake things up a little bit. And, and just try and make sure you're getting your connections filled, you know, with old friends or other folks or a therapist if you want to. I don't know if it's really feeling that hard, but make sure you're getting those needs of loneliness met because those can be really hard and we all understand that. Yeah. And I think some of the things just thinking after this conversation, it's like trying to find Maybe hobby is not the right word, but it's like how I, I picked up tennis. Well, I met all these people. Well, the ongoing joke in my house is that I have all these grandma friends because when I picked up tennis and didn't know how to play, I was playing with all the grandmas. And so my husband would laugh. He'd be like, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I'm going for drinks with the grandmas. Like, And I love them. I, first of all, I love having friends of different ages. It's so important. Yes. So I found this whole little cohort that I hung out with a lot of last summer and loved it. But you've talked about fitness classes. And so, again, I always say this with caution because you and I are in probably a little different season than some moms of, you know, our babies aren't babies' babies. And so there's a little more freedom. But I think if you feel like you're in this click, it might be like you're going to have to step out into something else. So like Mm -hmm. how I went and picked up tennis, um, which involved a little vulnerability of being willing to suck at something when I have a history of being a good athlete. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to go out and really not be good at something. Um, and then, or going to a fitness class or finding, I would say branching out from wherever these clicks are. And changing your routine is what you're saying. Change your routine, create a new routine so that you're meeting new people. Totally. I think that's, I think that's great. And I do also want to give a plug for having intergenerational relationships because research shows that people are happier and healthier and live longer if they have intergenerational relationships. Moreover, I want to make sure when we're talking about, you know, new moms being vulnerable with other new moms, when you get older, it's also really important that you leave space and time for developing friendships with people who look and are believe things that are different than you. Right. So some of my closest, most exciting friendships are with the 24 year olds who watch my sons. They are uncles to my kids. They are nephews slash sons to me, but they are my community and so life giving. And it took making time and space to develop friendships with people that are different because it's important. Totally. And I can think of a younger friend I have um, who I used to work with. And I also think sometimes you, when we're so busy and we're in our season of busyness, sometimes it can be even be even more awkward or like more intentional about making younger friends because you're like, well, they don't get it. They're not where I am and all the things. Whereas I feel like the grandmas have a lot of perspective. And uh-huh. so they're like, come on, honey. And you know, they want to, they're ready. They're in a different phase. They're ready to share yep. all their perspective with me. But I think we're kind of in this heated, busy season but I get so much from my younger friends. So much. I mean, what do you get from them? And I'll tell you what I get from them. Well, first of all, I love their, they still have zest for a lot of things. Uh-huh. <laughs> so uh-huh. I love their like zest and ideas. And I do feel like it gives me a chance to look back on stuff where I'm like, yeah, I should have done that or I should have whatever. And so I, a lot, of course I'm drawn to people who have all these ideas, but I love their ideas. Um, I love their willingness to hear my perspective. So a lot of times part of what they want from my friendship mm-hmm. is a little bit kind of what I like about the grandmas. Yes, like, absolutely. Give it to me, sister. What did we learn along the way? Like I can think of this one gal who's actually just about to become a grandma, but she's in a different season. Her kids are out of school and, and working and they're great kids. Like when she tells me about her kids, I'm like, yep. what did you do? I'm like, you crushed it. And so I'm always like kind of trying to pick her brain. And so I think 
I do like to give that to people. Like when people Mm -hmm. say like, I want to ask you about this, or I want to talk about how I heard you talk about this. Can we do this? That's nice. You kind of feel like you're passing it on. Like the same thing I'm grabbing from older moms. I have this moment to share and it is, I walk away feeling good about it. Like, I'm like, oh, I got to give something. I wasn't just taking. And, And I'll tell you the beauty of it is that those are the people that are giving that to your kids. Right. So I am very good friends with a woman who works with me, Caroline McGargle. She's 30. I love hearing about her life. It's fun. She's doing fun stuff that I wish I was doing. I miss. But she is able to talk to my kids and mentor my kids and be friends with my kids because they need that in in the middle too. And believe me, when she has a baby, who's going to be, I don't need to be talking to my husband about having another baby when I know Caroline's going to have a baby and I can just go hold that baby all the time, right? It is developing. We can't have these communities and villages of just people our age and just people that look like us because then we're only offering the same thing. We have to be going intergenerationally to take care of our whole family. Totally. See, I told you I was getting real cheesy, Allison, but this is what I love to talk about. <laughs> I know. Well, that's why you're good at what you do. Um, and so we've, I think we've kind of talked about this too. So another mom had talked about um, feeling like she didn't have time to make the friends and wanted us to talk about that. But I think we probably have. So it's really probably about the routine, like building in the routine to cultivate those friends she already has that she feels like she can't keep up with. So here's the other thing that I do that is pretty helpful for me is I have kind of a standing double book. So every Tuesday at 845, I work out with women that are similar to me. Now, I am i don't have time to go out to coffee, really, but I have time to work out and connect with my friends. It's at Progress Seville. We ask them to turn the music down. So we talk the whole time about our husbands, about our jobs, about our kids, and it's in our routine. But what's the best about that is that every time I meet someone out on the streets, it's like, hey, we should get together. I'm like, yes, I'm at 845 at Progress Seville. I'll like, I would love to see you there. It's a standing invitation anytime. Like, this is the time to do it. So it's kind of like, it's not like this, hey, when do you want to do it? Should we do it? It's like, this is my double hit. If if we're going to elevate this to the next level, like this is kind of what I have to give. And so, but I do reserve that spot and it's always there to chat and make new relationships because it's fun. And I do think people say all the time, like, oh, I can't believe you picked up tennis. That's been my, that's the latest thing that I'm hearing about. Like you picked up tennis. How do you make the time? And this is where... I could get on a soapbox about this, but yeah, I am a person and I was a person before I had kids. I had a lot going on and I am still a person and I am definitely a better mom when I get to be a person outside of parenting. So when people say like, how'd you do that? I'm like, I made it. I, I actually did make it happen. And luckily I, I do know, cause I have lots of clients who've talked to me about this, but my husband's very supportive of me having my own thing. So I do know that I'm lucky in that. But I also think as moms, we have to remember like you were a person and you still are Mm -hmm. and your kids will benefit from you carving it out. And when people ask me like, how do you do it all? I'm like, I will tell you exactly how I do it all. My house is a hot mess. (laughs) I understand. Yeah. Like if something's got to give for me, I look around and I'm like, the house is going to give. Like that's what gives. So I have plenty of friends that keep impeccable homes. And every time I go in there, I'm like, this is lovely. My house is a hot mess. I just show you what my dining room table looks like right now. (laughs) And so I would say like, you just kind of got to decide what makes you be a person. Some people can't live in a messy house. I can. I can too. I want to go play tennis. (laughs) So I just, I always think that when I think about the friend thing, although by no means am I a master of making friends, but like, we have to fill our cups. And if it's a friendship that would fill your cup or it's going to your fitness class, which will probably make you friends or to my tennis, which is going to make me friends. I do think, and I feel like this is kind of a good place for us to kind of wrap it up is we matter. We are people, whether you're a mom or a dad or whoever, you are a person and you should prioritize that. Absolutely. You're going to be a better parent if you prioritize that. And 
In fact, I don't know if you can be a great parent without friends. We know that friends make us happier and healthier. And so if we want to be there for our kids, we have to do it for ourselves. It's imperative. I love it. Well, Amanda, this has been awesome. And thank you so much for your time. I feel like we've touched on a lot, but is there anything that you feel like we missed or final point you would like to make? I think it's just making sure that we make it a priority, knowing it's important. And if it's hard for you, that's okay. It's hard for a lot of folks. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you, but since I am a mental health therapist, if you ever feel lonely, reach out to a therapist. It's worth it. They can give you some strategies and also help you feel a little less alone because it's it's kind of too hard to live this life without friends. Okay. On that topic, I'm going to ask you one more question. Where is a good place for someone to start when looking for a therapist? Because I feel like it's really easy in theory to say, yeah, get a therapist. And for someone to say like, yes, I'm open to that. But then what? I think that's a great question. So I would start with personal recommendations if you can. So asking your pediatrician, asking you know, asking friends, personal recommendations can go really, really far because there are some therapists out there that are amazing and some that are not as amazing. And you need to find the right fit for you. Each fit is really, really important. So you can look at your insurance company. You can also, we have a lot of therapists at Virginia Family Therapy, and that's just www.virginiafamilytherapy.com. And we see folks outside of Virginia. And also you can look at Psychology Today, Dot com, which is, but it's all about the fit to me and about the relationship and finding the person that you're going to relate to, have some fun with, be vulnerable with, problem solve with. The relationship is so important. So it might not be a one and done, kind of like finding a friend. <laughs> you might explore some and take a bet. Absolutely. And if you're not feeling like it's a great fit, you can always just say, hey, this isn't a great fit. I'm going to find someone else. And that's okay. It happens. Relationships are important. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today. Can you tell everyone how they can find you? Oh, absolutely. So I am the CEO of Virginia Family Therapy, and that is www.virginiafamilytherapy.com. And I host a podcast, Active and Connected Families Podcast. Perfect. And we will link to all of that in the show notes. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Allison. I hope you have a good... I'm jealous of the tennis, so I hope you have some good games this weekend. (laughs) I hope to see you out there soon. Oh, you will. I talked to my husband about it last night. Love it. Talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you for listening to How Long Till Bedtime. To learn how we can work together to improve your child's sleep, please visit sleepandwellnesscoach.com.